All right, everybody, welcome to a little bit of a, uh, a unique edition of the podcast. I'm Jordan Hill, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm with Opelika Auburn News. Uh, going with uh, a unique setup with some news today, uh, we're recording on Thursday. We've got Travis L. Brown from the Bryan College Station Eagle. Uh, Travis, a little bit of, uh, of sort of parallels between Auburn and Texas A&M news on Thursday. Jack Calzada is leaving Texas A&M. We knew he had already entered the portal. He's coming to Auburn. Um, what was what was sort of your reaction, Travis, to the news? And even going back to when he was actually playing at AM, your thoughts on Zach and sort of what he was able to do this year at Texas AM? Well, I think the first thing that everyone there, there's two things that stand out about Zach Calzada when he was at AM. The first, of course, is he beat Alabama. And there's only a few quarterbacks, uh, as y'all at Auburn are, are well aware of, that that have been able to accomplish. Uh, that feat over the last decade or so. Um, so that is the biggest standout, of course, that everyone knows. The other thing is he is a tough son of a gun. He uh, hurt his knee uh, early in the season uh, in, in the Alabama game and then hurt his shoulder, I believe, in that Auburn game uh, and then was able to kind of fought through, had offseason surgery that this uh, this offseason or, or, or towards the end of the season here uh, on the, this non-throwing shoulder, but battled because he was the only quarterback scholarship quarterback on AM's roster going through the season after Haynes King was injured in the second game of the season at Colorado. That's Zach Calzada stepped up and took his place. So um, those are the two things that stand out the most. He, he, he has a strong, strong arm, but at times he's throwing fastballs no matter what the, 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 uh, the kind of throw is. So a lot of times screen passes might have gotten out of uh, some, some wide receivers' hands, some running backs' hands, passes to the flats because he was burning them in there. Uh, and even some of his receivers in, in the press conferences kind of said like, hey, he's doing a great job. We really uh, uh, love what he's doing, his toughness. Maybe if he could not throw it so hard at times, that that would be an, a nice thing. Um, he, he absolutely showed his ceiling in that, um, Alabama win. He never really got back to that point um, through the season because uh, I know you know the, the probably the AM's next big, biggest win after that was that win over Auburn where there wasn't an offensive touchdown uh, and the offense kind of sputtered a little bit. Had um, two big interceptions against Ole Miss in that loss, um, and, and I think AM fans. Um, gave him a more of a tough time than he probably deserved getting thrown into the position that he was thrown into and playing through most of the season uh, hurt. So I think he has some upside. I think that it, it, it whoever got him got a quarterback who has a, a, a ton of experience and experience in, in some tough situations. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how a new set of coaches maybe can develop him a little bit more and see what he turns into uh, in, in the next few years. Cause he is a starting caliber quarterback with, with some upside just needs to have a little bit of growth. Yeah. I think uh, you hit on a few points that were really interesting to me too. The t- I mean, number one, the toughness. I mean, I think about watching that Alabama game just on TV and taking some of the, you know, seeing him take some of the shots he took. And then the Auburn game that you mentioned, I remember one of the hits he took, he went out and I just remember thinking, well, I mean, I guess they're playing this walk on. I mean, he's, and then it really wasn't that much later, maybe five minutes or so he's back in. Now, honestly, he might've only missed a couple of plays. I'd have to go back and look. I, he didn't actually miss a play because oh, really? they had, I was on the sidelines at that point. Cause I believe it was pretty late in the game and they, um, he, he, he took the shot, went into the tent and Blake Bose, the walk on backup was warming up on the sidelines and so I had tweeted, you know, hey, Blake Bost is, is warming up. He, he should come in. And before that tweet could even sent, he was running out of the tent and going back on the field to the Calzada chance from the student section. So, yeah, he didn't end up missing a, 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 a play on, on that at all. Yeah. So the thing to me, you know, I was Zach was someone that kind of made sense going in, you, you know, from everything we could tell when Bo Nix left Auburn there was the thought that they very well would go into the portal, that they would look at adding a quarterback. And, you know, Zach's a guy from Georgia, so, you know, a little bit closer to home. You thought that that would be, you know, a guy that would make sense. But um, from where I said, you know, you never really could tell who they were leaning toward, who they were trying to talk to. Um, I think the thing that's really interesting to me, and I saw a few Auburn fans, and I think pretty accurately point this out, you know, some of his completion numbers look a lot like Bo Nix. And, you know, a lot of people I already saw pointing out, well, you got a number 10 
coming in. You know, you had 10 going out in Bo Nix. Now you got a number 10 coming in with Calzada. You know, I'll be very interested to see what Brian Harson's able to do with Zach. Um, you know, Brian has been looked at as a quarterback whisperer, a guy that knows the position well. And, and you know, if Zach winds up being the guy, because there's some belief that Auburn's not done at, with quarterback in the portal, that they could potentially go at another guy. But if it is Zach that winds up really being in the mix and, you know, he'll have to beat TJ Finley and a few other guys if he's going to start next year, you know, there's going to be a lot of improvements that need to be made. And, you know, you look at Brian Harson as the head coach, they've got Austin Davis who's coming in, who was the Seattle Seahawks quarterbacks coach. You know, they're really going to have to fine tune and, and get him to play more consistently if they want to take that next step. And, and, you know, there's a lot really, I think, on the line uh, for Brian and, and for this entire Auburn program. I, I think that people aren't going to forget how 2021 went, six and seven, first losing season in nine years. Now you're kind of taking a chance on a quarterback that obviously when he was hot, I mean, he, again, like you said, he played really well and, and battled through injury in that Alabama win. But at the same time, throwing 90 miles an hour at guys when that doesn't need to be the case, you know, that that can be an issue. And that could be an issue, too, with this Auburn team. Uh, their receivers are a, real, a really big question. They, they lost earlier this week. Uh, Kobe Hudson, who was their leading receiver last year, was really, to me, as someone who watches the team, the one guy you felt really good about going into 2022. To everything else that receiver was a big question mark. So yeah, I'm really intrigued to see what this one's up looking like with Zach, um, how he kind of fits in. And again, he'll have to beat out some some guys that uh, are talented. I mean, TJ Finley showed flashes, kind of struggled once he had to start in Bo Nix's uh, absence. Uh, D Davis, a guy from Houston that uh, was a true freshman, never got to see the field this year. Maybe another year, uh, you know, a spring gets him an opportunity. And then Holden Garner, who is a uh, – or Holden Garner, I should say, a four-star. Uh, that's going to be a true freshman. Uh, you know, they're at least going to let him get in the mix. So, to see Zach get in the mix and, and be added to this is very interesting. Uh, and I'll be really intrigued to see how that kind of plays out. Yeah, you know, and, and here's the interesting thing that, that kind of popped up on my Twitter timeline that I'll be interested to see is another part about Calzada's um, time here at a and is – he really took it in the shorts from AM's uh, fan base a lot of times when after the expectations were were high that um, he could come in and, and replace Haynes King and there wouldn't be a lot of drop off. And there, there kind of was there up until that Alabama game. And there was again afterward, after it. And with Jimbo Fisher and the coaching, well, really Jimbo Fisher didn't do him any favors when they did announce that Haynes King was going to be the starter, saying that it was a neck and neck battle all the way to the end. And it could have been either guy, but Haynes King just did a little bit more to to separate himself. And that's what it was when they uh, when when he, he stepped in, there was a lot of really, really pointed vitriol pointed at his way through social media up until the point where after the LSU game, was it the LSU game? Yeah, the LSU game, he went on, posted a, uh, a, a abbreviated uh, insult aimed at the people of the fan base who were uh, criticizing him, asking for, uh, well, we won't get into it. But it was uh, it was an abbreviation and and ask requesting for um, some 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 people to to do some things that that aren't so nice and it was uh, taken down pretty quickly afterwards and so you go on and and I, you know I, I think that there's been some posting of some message board and some Auburn fans already talking about well you look around the the portal right now and you have Caleb Williams and you have several other different quarterbacks who have a pretty good pedigree. And Zach Calzada is what this coaching staff landed on. And so I'll be interested to see how, if that little bit of backlash and that kind of bad taste in your mouth feeling that was with the A&M fan base towards him is just going to be part of his reputation that carries over to Auburn and, and how he necessarily handles that and how the coaching staff maybe will handle that. Should he uh, either be the guy or have to see playing time because of whatever circumstances? 
Yeah, I'll be really interested uh, to see how that part goes because if uh, he's going to have to develop some thick skin because uh, Bo Nix, guy that just left, I mean, was an Auburn lifer. And, you know, he took a lot of criticism, some I think fair, others I think not so much. But, you know, I mean, and you can speak to this too, Travis, that's sort of the nature of playing quarterback in the SEC. Everybody, you know, wants to pat you on the back and say good job when you beat Alabama. And then when things aren't going so well, they want to see the next guy and they say that you're overrated. And, you know, that's just sort of the nature of it, whether that's fair or not. Yeah, that's something he's going to have to deal with, especially, you know, he's stepping into a situation where if he is the starting guy, you know, you got Alabama in the same state and you got Georgia right next door, your big rival in the east. One of them's going to have another national title under their belt by the time 2022 gets here. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a lot of pressure on him. Um, I'll be very interested to see just sort of what that looks like and, and what, what we get to kind of hear from from him in the spring and the coaches and sort of how that all kind of goes, um, how it comes together his first spring, especially at Auburn. Um, tell me about just sort of the quarterback situation at AM with Max Johnson stepping in, uh, just how things are sort of looking um, and, and how things, you know, in your perspective uh, appear to be going into 2022. Yeah, this is about as robust of a quarterback room as AM has had since you could probably go back to the Kyler Murray, Kyle Allen days before all the transfers uh, and see how deep they are at the position group. Because you got to think Haynes King is the front, uh, the leader in the clubhouse because he he won out the position last year before he he got hurt. And his he's a coach's son uh, from a, a, a longstanding uh, a high school powerhouse in the in the in the state. Uh, and has that knowledge. He has the mobility. He has, he, he can make the throws. Um, I think that he is the guy that with another year in the system and having had that kind of uh, assistant coaching a uh, little bit role while he was uh, uh, develop, uh, re- rehabbing from the, the broken leg, you got to think he's, he's the leader. But really the next guy on the list is Connor Wigman, the four-star quarterback who is part of this uh, record-setting um, uh, recruiting class a and brought in. He's a guy that Jimbo Fisher has raved about. I mean, absolutely raved about. And, you know, when we were in the, um, the, the, the signing day press conference, um, no one actually mentioned the name Quinn Ewers because, uh, the, of course, the Ohio State quarterback who entered the transfer portal was said to be looking at several Texas schools and some reports had Texas A&M mixed in there. And, and no one really directly asked about that. But when asked about Wigman and his recruitment and and Jimbo's thoughts on him. Jimbo went in hard and said, this is my guy. I know a lot of people said some stuff and there was some other guy, but he's always been my guy. He will be my guy. I think he's the best quarterback as a part of this class uh, and just kind of raved about him. And and he Wigman showed out in the Under Armour All-American game uh, this past weekend and and really kind of proved why uh, he was so highly thought of by Jimbo Fisher. So I think the real race is actually going to be between those two guys because, um, and, and while I think Haynes King is the leader and, and could very well be the guy and be a guy that really succeeds at AM, it would not surprise me at all if Wigman is, is necessarily the guy getting the snaps at the first game. And then you mix Mac jo- Max Johnson in who, who transferred over because his brother, who was the number one tight end recruit in the, uh, uh, country as a part of this 2022 class was lured in by a on a on a signing day uh, flip there for, for the Aggies, who, who actually, weirdly enough, signed three tight ends as a part of this class, which th- it, it is still the year 2022. Uh, that's weird. But it is Jimbo Fisher. But anyway, the two brothers are going to get to play with each other. And that just adds a little bit more depth and a little bit more experience to this room. And man, like that is going to be a quarterback battle, unlike any I've been a part of um, in a really long time and, and covered and, and uh, I, I can't really think of one that was maybe more potent or robust than that uh, in a while. Um, you might could, could, could have something to say about that, but man, it, it's going to be, it's going to be something to follow for the off season and, and into the fall camp for, for the Aggies spring, the spring practice might actually be exciting to cover for once. Yeah, you got something to talk about. That's, that's a little bit uh, change in the uh, in how things typically go. And over here with the way it stands right now, to me, it'll be Calzada versus TJ Finley. You know, I think that uh, Demetrius Davis, the guy I talked about, that's from North Shore, that uh, had a lot of success in high school. I mean, he was a Gus Malzahn recruit. He wound up signing after Gus was fired. 
you kind of wondered how that fit would work. He never saw the field, even when there were questions leading into the Birmingham Bowl about, well, could we see D on the field? Could we see him getting some playing time? Brian Harson was kind of coy about it. That didn't really promise anything. Nothing happened. He never saw the field in the loss to Houston. So I think it's going to be Calzada, and I think it's going to be between him and Finley. And, again, there's there's people that think, um, you know, I would give a shout-out to Christian Clemente with rivals. He seems to think that they may go add another quarterback. Who that's going to be, I don't know. Um, that could be a guy that winds up being – sort of the presumptive starter going into 2022. But as it stands, it's probably going to be Calzada and Finley. And, uh, again, it'll be interesting going into spring, just like you were saying with the Aggies. There's probably going to be plenty to talk about and and plenty to look at. Uh, Before we wrap this up, Travis, just kind of give me a lay of the land right now at A&M, not only with football and and having that outstanding recruiting class, basketball going on, just sort of what all's going on. And, and again, kind of a busy start to a new year, but I'm sure that you guys have been all over. it. Yeah. You know, I, and I'm going to do the same for you to ask a little bit, at least about Auburn uh, basketball uh, coming up. Cause I know the Aggies have a big bout with them in February, but yeah, A&M it's a busy time right now. You know, A&M was able to sign the number one recruiting class in the nation. Maybe some say 247 says the best recruiting class in the modern recruiting era all of that without having a defensive coordinator because Mike Elko, of course, went to Duke to take the head coaching job and they just signed or, or reportedly are going to sign uh, DJ Durkin uh, this week uh, as the new defensive coordinator. And so um, with pulling in, I, I think I just did the count, 15 defensive recruits in a class of 27 total recruits, including the number two recruit in the nation, Walter Nolan, a couple of strong defensive linemen. Uh, that was really a coup for, for, for Jimbo Fisher and his staff. Cause you got to think that you, you would have thought that a few of those guys might've looked elsewhere, or at least waited until February to sign to see who the defensive coordinator would be, but they went ahead and put pen to paper and made it happen. And that was a, a, a big story around here, of course, um, with everything going in there. And then just kind of seeing where this, uh, when this Durkin thing will become uh, officially official and they'll get him in there and what that'll look like, because uh, the biggest question that I have, in regards to that is AM has made their, their bread and butter since for the majority of the time they've been in the SEC has been a four man front. And that defensive line has been a big key to some of those defenses, especially last year, you want to look at. And then you also have guys that when um, Miles Garrett and Deshaun Hall were here um, back in the, the, the mid teens and what they were doing as part of a four man front and how many defensive linemen AM has put into the league. Um, Durkin has. Well, he's been multiple and he's run a, a four, three at times, really his bases revolve around uh, like a three, three, five, or, or mostly a lot of three man fronts. So is, is he going to bring that and want to, is a going to be multiple and, 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 and do a little bit of both, or are they going to still stick with that four man down lineman front um, that, that they've really had success with uh, so far and, and kind of rearrange how they do that system. I think that's going to be a really interesting thing to see. Also then, uh, men's basketball front, a and brings in nine transfers this year after having 10, I think, go out. Um, so completely reset the program. They're 12 and two heading into their second game. Had to have a buzzer beater win over Georgia on Friday. But um, I think that, this is an a and team that shoots extremely better than any of the two that have been under Buzz William in his first two years. They're actually one of the top uh, 15 in the country, I believe, in uh, three-point shooting percentage. Um, so they can actually shoot the ball, and they're in the top 15 in both turnover percentage defensively and steals. Um, they do a lot of live ball turnovers that turn into transition baskets uh, and can really jump on teams that way. They just have to get over having a lull uh, through the middle part of some of the games. That's exactly what happened to Georgia. They had an 18 point lead and then just kind of took the gas, the, 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 the pedal off the gas a little bit and, uh, and turned the ball over a little bit, had a little bit of trouble in their half court offense and, and gave up some points in the paint to Georgia that allowed them to get back into the game. Georgia took its first lead of the game with five seconds left and they need that big Marcus Williams three pointer uh, to put it out. I'm really excited about what, um, what this AM team could bring. I, I think that probably most people, I kind of posed the question to AM fans. And I think if they, if they did finish middle of the pack, take an, an NIT bid that most people would be happy and would see growth in a, in a, program that is it's been weird because you had a strong start to the buzz williams era and then they go into um 
uh, the, the SEC tournament that first year, and that gets canceled because of COVID. And then AM had more games canceled because of a COVID outbreak last year than any team in the country while having a pretty down year. And it's hard to necessarily measure growth. I think if they get an NIT bid, finish middle of the pack, um, that would be uh, show signs of growth. And, and I think that if they continue with this three point shooting trend, maybe knock off a few teams, maybe like an Auburn down the line to, to get a couple, a little bit of strength to schedule, maybe they could be a bubble team. Well, what do you think of this Auburn team? They, they seem to be really a, a, a strong threat to, to make a push in this SEC that that is really top heavy and maybe as stacked as it's been in a really long time. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they've, you know, coming in this year, you thought that they had a chance to be really good. They added four transfers and all four guys that you thought would probably contribute. And then you have a five star in Jabari Smith. And coming into the year, Bruce Pearl really talked about that he felt like this was a team that was capable of making a Final Four run like they did a few years ago. And they've lived up to it so far. I mean, right now they're on a 10 game winning streak. The only loss they had, I think, was double overtime to UConn. And they've looked to, to me, all the part of an SEC contender, a team that, um, you know, is going to show up most nights and take care of business. They're coming off right now a, a big win against South Carolina, which they pretty much dominated, and South Carolina got it close with like six minutes left. And and then Auburn just kind of closed the door on them. I think it wound up being about a 15-point win. Uh, they've been really impressive. They've got – they the thing that has got this team to me in a position where – they really can talk about making a run in March and, and being a team people have to worry about is their depth. I mean, they are so deep. Uh, Wendell Green, who is really he comes off the bench as one of the guards, has been outstanding. I think he scored in double figures, something like five or six games in a row at this point. I think that there's a lot of hype and, and justifiably so for what this team can be and what this team can do. Uh, and the thing that will help them is depth if they wind up losing a couple guys uh, due to injury or in prime situations if COVID winds up being a factor and you have uh, key players missing, you know, I think that they've got the depth to be able to overcome that. And uh, and it's been a really fun team to cover. I mean, that's kind of been my biggest thing just as someone who likes watching basketball. They're just a very fun team to watch. They get a lot of different guys involved every night. Uh, whether it's Wendell Green having a big night, Katie Johnson, who's one of the shooting guards, has uh, been all over the floor. Walker Kessler had the only the second triple-double in Auburn basketball history last week against LSU. Uh, they're a really fun team, and I think that they're going to be a team that hangs around. And as long as they can stay healthy, I think once we get to March, they're going to be a team we're all going to be really looking at as a team that has what it takes to, to try to go out there and win a championship. Yeah, that, uh, that matchup will be February 12th over there in Auburn, the only time the two teams uh, face each other. Um, so a lot of basketball to be played until then, but one that we'll keep an eye out on. And I'm sure readers and the Eagle will probably read y'all's write-up as, you know, the, the lovely Lee Enterprises uh, uh, conglomerate exchange program uh, is, is at its finest. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> uh, looking forward to that. I think it'll be fun. Um, well, Travis, I think that's all on my end. Anything else about Calzada, about a and just a and sports right now that we haven't hit on that you want to throw in before we wrap this up? Oh, man. I, I mean, I think that hit all of it. We're, it's busy. I think hit, the other interesting thing, at least from the AM front, is you got you know the revival of the, U, uh, the USFL with uh, head, former head coach Kevin Sumlin getting back into the uh, the mix with the Houston team. Another big breaking news today from the, from the A&M front, so we'll sh- be sure to see how uh, – how that turns out and how, how that could uh, fate, uh, look for, for Aggies and if he can still coach a little bit. So other than that, man, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the silly season of, of multiple sports going on and what, like 42 days till baseball, something like that. I mean, it's going to be crazy. Jim Schlossnagel era starting here at uh, Texas A&M. So we'll see uh, how, how are things uh, wrapping up with Auburn and, and what's uh, what's on the front for y'all. Yeah, well, you mentioned USFL. There's rumors it's not officially yet that Gene Chizik, the former Auburn coach, is going to coach one of the Birmingham teams. So, uh, so that would be uh, another connection there. Another thing I'd be remiss to not mention: we've got gymnastics coming up, and Suni Lee, who has really been the talk of Auburn for you know six months now, going back to when she won the gold medal. That's going to be a big deal. People are really excited. I had a chance to go to the preview meet. You know, essentially an exhibition in December. 
and it was packed. And I think that that's what we're going to see once we get into the season. So that's kind of the biggest stuff at this point is knowing yeah. Jim coming up and, and kind of getting ready for that. And then, like you said, baseball and, and softball as well will be here before we know it. That's something that always gets brought up when, you know, uh, athletic director Ross Bjork here has a monthly town halls on Facebook Live is if A&M is going to start a gymnastics program. And he's always said, no, they want to stick with the budget of what they have right now. But man, if, if A&M did enter into the gymnastics game, it would be an absolute game changer because I know, and I know this is very dated data, but when I was back up with the Fort Worth Star Telegram and the NCAA uh, finals were held up there in, in Fort Worth, I want to say 2014, 15, that, that range, 2015 maybe, I think 60% of the gymnasts that were competing from teams like Florida and Oklahoma and UCLA, and I can't remember if Auburn was there or not, but a lot of those SEC schools, I think like 60% were from the state of Texas because Texas doesn't have a division one gymnastics team. Their, their only real one is a division two team at Texas women's up in Denton. And I've always thought, man, I know it's a, it's a, a pretty sizable initial investment with all of the uh, you know, equipment and, and things like that. But that could be a program that could compete, could be competing for titles really quickly with the, uh, with the recruiting tactic of you get to stay close to home. I, I, who knows? Maybe a will jump into that gymnastics fray at some point. But it, it's, I, I think I, I, there's probably a lot of a fans who know how big gymnastics is in the SEC. But, like, how big is gymnastics in the SEC? Oh, it's huge. And right now, I think that really Auburn's kind of adding to that surge. I think that people are excited. And that's a big thing, I think, that has so much excitement around Auburn gymnastics is you got to, I mean, they've got a, a very good chance at competing on a national level. And everybody likes winners, Travis. Everybody wants, <laughs> I mean, everybody wants to support a winner. And that's what SUNY Lee is. And that's what's got so many people so excited it's just fun I, I don't have a ton of experience covering gymnastics and even just being at that preview meet, I, I was very entertained by just sort of the atmosphere and, and how much people are already into it and yeah like you were saying I think you know if they can add gymnastics if A&M has an opportunity at some point too um, it would only do good for for them and for gymnastics like you said in the state I mean that'd be a big opportunity they could uh, put together and, and probably get a whole lot of caliber gymnasts uh, to the school. It all comes down to the balance being, man. That, that's what I learned. It all comes down to the balance. How, how, how good would your floor routine be? What, what, what songs, Ooh. what song would your floor routine be to? Who? I mean, if you're at Auburn, like I know it's not quite like LSU kind of leans into it, but like I the tiger, I feel like going okay. to school, something like that. Balance being would be rough. I'd have to really, really work on, some of the, I think my, I think beam would be my worst. Uh, I'm not very good on the balance. What, what would your go-to go? Uh, oh go gosh. Go-to uh, event. Well, if we're, if we're sticking to this like team related thing, I mean, I think you'd have to do a, a floor routine to like God bless Texas, right? Like you well, just yeah. lean okay. heavy into that. Or, or, you know, you could do some as, as what happens at Kyle field now because of this thing. And it kind of is a little cringeworthy, the air fiddle with, if you're going to play in Texas, All right. there's nothing okay. really more awkward than, than like dudes wearing overalls playing air fiddle. Um, so, you know, maybe that could be incorporated into it somehow. Um, you know, I, I think that I watch a lot of American Ninja Warrior. So maybe some bars might be in my, you know, I've never actually tried it, but since I watch it, that that's good enough. Right. So maybe, maybe we'll throw, maybe I'll be more of a bar specialist than ballad beam, but you know, that's, that's just me. Yeah, I may have to do vault and then just try to do like a cannonball or something. Like it's not going to be very pretty. The landing will not be very pretty. But I, I, I have I, been to a trampoline park, so it's it's like the same thing, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. good, it's gonna, good. I'm going to request if I do it that they have like those bouncy ball, like those little plastic balls, like you're at McDonald's. I can land. Yeah, media day. They need to have a media day at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> and and have a few uh you know IVs and uh and stretchers and some cold beer. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think on that note, I think we about covered it. Travis, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh let's get out of here and get ready for what's gonna be a, a really busy spring at, at uh in College Station and in Auburn as well. You got it. Hey, for my uh listeners, readers, where can they find your stuff? Yeah, uh at AU blog on Twitter, at Jordan Davis Hill on Twitter. OANow.com would be uh, the website. You can see all our content there. And then for our readers, Travis, throw out there uh, where they can see y'all stuff. 
Yeah, I'm at Travis underscore L underscore Brown on Twitter. And of course, it's theeagle.com. Uh, and then you just click the little Aggie Sports tab and we got all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, so be sure to check that out as well. We'll get out of there on that. Again, Travis, thanks for everybody for listening. Until next time, take care. Thanks.